So we don't have a quorum tonight for the planning commission. So this is going to be an informational meeting. Um, and so I think we're just going to talk about what I've learned about the bike path and Nikki and I have discussed it over the course of a couple of weeks now too. Um, so if you want to weigh in with your own experiences, you should feel free to. Um, Hi, Maria. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Yeah. Oh, hello. Yeah. Sorry. I'm in transit. So I, I will be listening, listening. So I'll try to weigh in if I feel necessary, if it feels necessary. Okay. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so I, my take on this whole situation is that like when you, I feel like when you start asking people about it, they're instantly looking for solutions. And I don't think that's like the, the first stage of this. This should be figuring out what's actually happening and then deciding whether it's, you know, worth city resources to address the issue. Could you give me just a little bit of background? Because I, I know you mentioned that there's, it seems like there's some safety things and maybe some kids have been accosted. Could you just maybe yeah. step back? And so that's what I wanted. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. I think today, as I was going to say, I was like, I think this should only be about discussing what's happening. Yeah. Um, because I think the reality is that people who are of a certain age, a certain gender, aren't experiencing it the way that others are. Um, and especially if you're a motorist, this is a part of town that you don't even see. Um, so I, mean, I can run through. I have a spreadsheet here of people I've talked to, um, and they've shared their experiences. So the first one is an 11 year old boy who bicycles around town. And he was just saying that he, his parents have explicitly told him not to use it. Not to um, use the bike path. Not to use the bike path. And he bikes everywhere. Um, a girl who is 10, who she would walk with a bunch of other kids. So this is three friends that are walking to field hockey practice. Um, several times men would yell things at them and ask them questions, try to engage them. Um, she said once a seventh grader had something really bad said to her and she refused to tell me what was said to the seventh. You know, this is a 12 year old. Yeah. It's embarrassing. Um, and I'm like an adult, <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> you know? Yeah. So then after that incident, they stopped walking on the bike path to get to the high school because it was so scary. Um, but again, this is a 12 year old that apparently had something yelled at her. Um, and then interestingly, I asked after this whole discussion, I was like, wait a second, have you told your parents? And she hadn't. And I was like, do you not want me to tell your parents? And she kind of gave me a look like, I do, you know, so it's like this like sense that they're doing that these kids are doing something wrong uh -oh. by even using the bike path. Oh, you know what I mean? That like they feel that they've done something wrong. Like um, all the parents know that don't go on the bike path or yeah, something. Like everyone knows you don't go on the bike path. Oh, wow. Uh, a woman in her thirties, this is near the co-op. So those two other issues were near the transit center. A woman in her thirties was walking with a friend near the co-op. Men started hollering sexual comments at her, um, talking about her body, including her ass. So obviously they felt entirely unsafe. Another girl who's 15 uh, near the transit center, walks on the path daily to get to school with her friends, repeatedly harassed. Men start following them, yelling out to ask how old, how old they are, making like kissy faces at them. Again, this, this is like 14, 15 year olds. Um, a couple of times she said it led to really scary situations, but then they saw that there were teenage boys walking with them. And so they were left alone. So like, even that situation, you're like, so uh, talking to high schoolers, they think that they are adults who can handle this. And you're like, you're not, you're still a child. <laughs> um, another you girl. You describe most of them as the, the people creating the problems are mostly homeless, just normal. I mean, is it, is it well, the a, same group of. I mean, people don't know. Okay. And especially children, like they're not. Um, they're not focusing on like what exactly the one guy who was saying this stuff to them looked like to distinguish them between the other. They're just trying to get away. Yeah. Probably they're yeah. like, let's get the heck out of here. They're trying yeah. to get out of way. Because yeah. people will ask me if I'm talking about it with like other folks. You know, like was was it the homeless or was it just somebody who was just 
Well, unless there's I, like a tent nearby, you yeah, don't really know, know their yeah. situation. Um, and I've, I have had that comment from like several people who are like, I don't know, like I wouldn't be able to like call the police about this because I don't know who it was. Mm -hmm. But it's just like a mass of people yelling things at them. Um, so I'm not even halfway through my list yet. Okay, keep going. <laughs> Yo, keep going. I'm like, so a girl who's 11 also walks and cycles around town, same field hockey. Her parents have explicitly told her not to use the bike path. Um, a woman in her 40s, and this has happened near the high school. So, you know, the bike path extends near the high school. She was walking her dog with a friend and a cyclist swerved to miss her dog and ended up in like a snowbank. And he started cursing her out, like everything under the book, you know, and then he biked away. But then he, when he got to the intersection, he stopped, turned around, came back at them and started screaming at them that if he ever saw them on the bike path again, he was going to kill her and her dog. Um, another time, a girl 15, she was walking with her mother. This is near Sarduji. So again, like think about that other stretch of the bike path. Um, a person jumped out from under that abandoned rail car, that like rusted up rail car, mm -hmm. and ran towards them, threatening them. Oh my gosh. A woman in her 30s regularly runs on the bike path. This has happened near the transit center. She started using the train tracks instead of the bike path because it's so unsafe. Um, she's also considered whether she should start carrying mace on her runs to keep her safe. Um I was going to say another related, um, a woman did call up the police to ask them about, would it be safe for her daughter to walk to school on the bike path? And whoever she spoke to at the police station told her that he wouldn't recommend children using the bike path, like not in groups and definitely not alone. Um, so a woman in her 30s again, running alone. This is this happened near the high school. A man was on a bike and seemed to be on drugs. And she actually stopped her run and turned around instead of trying to interact, you know, trying to run past him. Um, this was a significant situation where as a woman leading a tour group uh, in her, th I'm guessing 30s or 40s near the Trent Center. And a popular live has been hosting a bunch of uh, river walks do you know about this, Mike? Like, mm, no. I think it's a weekly walk to kind of address, to, to like reconnect the city to its to the river and talking about like the logical health of the river. And they regularly have like thirty to fifty people in these tour groups. Um, so she says, as part of the tour, they often they won't even go near the bike path; they'll just stay on like the the parking lot side to give people space. And a couple of weeks ago, a group of people that regularly hang out there approached them and like sat in and listened to their, her lecture and then started yelling angrily at the group when no one would give them any donations or anything. And I forget her exact quote was, um, I mean, it's also crude and I'm sorry that I had to like say it, <laughs> but I think it gives you the sense of like, what people are dealing with. Okay, so he was yelling at them. So you'll stop to listen to this horse shit, but you won't help ho homeless people. <laughs> Again, this is like a group of like 50 people who just want to like learn about the river. Um, Moving on. A man in his 40s was using the bike path and a man approached and physically threatened to punch him. A boy, um, he goes to the high school. So this started when he was 14, when he started at the high school. So he says men regularly harass him and his friends walking to school. If there's girls with them, they'll get cat called. I mean, he just acted as if this is just like, this happens every day. Um, he also, a different time, um, witnessed a man overdosing and had to run to find a police officer to get help. Again, this is a boy who's like 14. Uh, a girl who's 14 says she actually doesn't use a bike path at all because of all the bad stories she's heard at school from friends who had experiences on the bike path. Um, they kind of both said that if like you go to the high school and ask kids there, like they will all tell you similar stories. Um, and then my, I think, I think I told you like my own situation where I took a bunch of kids on the bike path. Um, and 
the men started following us and then like eventually like we were trying to get away <laughs> it's like the thing and everyone's just like trying to get away um and it was me and a bunch of like maybe first graders like little kids and by the end they're just like well you're never coming back this way again are you um so like and they're like are you a teacher what are you you know it was just like a very strange like let it go you know um so i mean i feel i find it all very troubling that this is just like happening how did you get basis. how did you get your data did you put something on front porch forum and ask for stories or I how did you ask anybody you like, just asked anybody you like, just so this is anecdotal you went out and you just talked to people and this is the kind of data you were able to get yes i never had someone tell me that they walk or run on the bike path and have not had an issue so i walk you on do? the bike path yeah i see the strange people but they don't they don't bother me. And I've been out there with my wife too, but I, I mean, I see all, I can see where, right. I can see where the issues would come up. But they've never said anything to you. They don't say anything to me. They don't say anything that they don't even. No, no. Hmm. No, I guess. I, I just have I, that look. Yeah, but... you have, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so this is the thing that's interesting is that I'll have, you know, I mean, I, I have had, I've used the bike path myself with my family and no one has said things to us. But then I'm like, oh, so it's only if I have a six foot two man with me that they'll leave me alone. Um, and I think that's the reality of it. It's just like, if you are vulnerable, like you will get harassed. Um, but yeah, I didn't hear from any girls who use a big path and could do it safely. Yeah. Um, yeah. Girls either completely avoid it or their parents have told them not to use it or they have a story to tell. Yeah. Wow. And also for like young, I mean, younger women, like in their thirties. So. And it's some of your stories, there are multiple, there's groups of people and they're still having, so it's not like uh, groups. I mean, it's really, I mean, the one group of like the tour group, that was a massive group, but yeah, even with like friends, they're getting yeah. bothered. And the thing is that I don't think people use it without a group of friends. Like they don't think it's safe to go. <laughs> they, yeah. they won't go there by themselves. It's such a beautiful resource. So. So Mike, what what are, what do we what can we do as a planning commission? I mean, I don't I know you had mentioned maybe having somebody from the police department. They obviously couldn't get anybody here tonight. Well, I we were also just trying to keep things as Maria said, we're just trying to get information at this point yeah. and you know, I'll bring back these uh topics and stories and see what um the the input from the enforcement side is and what they already know about and what they may already be working on and what they can and can't do. Um, I think some... I feel like I've seen some Montpelier police on bikes, but I don't know that I've mm. ever actually seen them on the exercise trail. On bikes, really? I see them on foot. I see them do foot patrol downtown. We actually mentioned that. I guess they used to be on bikes. Yeah, they have they have a bike patrol. Um, mm -hmm. COVID kind of blew everything up. But I know they used to have bikes. They used to do a lot of walking in the downtown. I I don't know the full schedule of where things are at at this point. Um, so there's there is there's obviously the the enforcement side. But um, as Maria sent around a whole bunch of documents on stuff, there's also design things and things we can look at. And I think it's going to come down to a solution that's a combination of things that we will have to look at and. That's why I was asking about, you know, is it just certain, you know, is it just the homeless or is it everybody right. or is it this? Because, we, you know, they'll tr they'll want to try to narrow it down and narrow it down by area. You know, if you get past the co-op, is it not as bad as you're heading out of town or is it still unsafe out there? I haven't seen anybody out there. I mean, I think it's, I think you have, I mean, I think it's, I think it's people that are homeless or unhoused. Um there's that, uh, what's the little day center that they can go to on, um, on Stone uh, Cunder's way. Yeah. There's what, what is that? It yeah, seems like, like another way. It's another yes. Way. It seems like there's a little bit of a, a flow that comes, you know, from there and extends all the way, you know, down to the co-op. There's some benches and stuff. And yeah, I and see a lot. I, I haven't had issues. And then I see a lot by the side. transit. I've car. had people say things on the transit center side yeah. or yeah. just do things that are inappropriate on and and it's also a little bit trashy over there too. Just yeah. So this is my so I was as I was saying I think there's like planning solutions here because I think I don't think law enforcement alone can do anything because like as soon as they sweep an area, 
mean, 20 minutes later, why wouldn't someone just come back? Right, they just come back. Um, whereas like on the co-op stretch, like I also run on the bike path every day and I don't see people loitering like that. Um, but I think it's like an entirely different environment. Like there's like a lot of foot traffic. There's a lot of car traffic. It's just like a very active part of the city, mm -hmm. especially because the co-op is there. So there's like constantly like people like coming in and out and there's uh, businesses there. But that section that is near the trans center just has a lot of like blind turns. Yeah. And even the, I think the berm is there for the river hazard reg regulations, I'm guessing. Um, and even that kind of creates this, like, it's like a very secluded spot, which I think creates that feeling of unease. sense of danger. Yeah. yeah. And there actually is, there, <laughs> it actually is dangerous. Yeah. But I think it kind of like creates this, it's almost like a cul-de-sac, you know, like you don't want to go through there because it doesn't feel safe. Um, like the sight lines are poor. They're often sitting under like tall brush and shaded trees. So they're mm -hmm. also kind of like yeah. people are hidden, right? which also creates that sense of unease. I mean, the one case of like the trail, the train car, that's like a very clear. Yeah, that's, that's, that's crazy. Know, like, why is, I don't know why it's there, uh -huh. but that is like a very clear there's a clear fix um but it's like a situation <laughs> where there's like somewhere for somebody to hide yeah and they can jump out of you yeah, yeah, yeah. so the whole bike Whereas, path right now over there is quite overgrown yeah i don't know why that is at the moment yeah so i think there's stuff like that that could be done just like regular cleanup yeah i mean there's also literally trash all over yeah that part of the bike path and i'm guessing there was there was a proposal to put up a fence on that side of the bike path hmm. that would go along and help to to try to keep they were having the the council and the city was having it were having issues with the homeless camping down there so they were right. trying to keep them out of that area because we have to then go down and clean everything up and and it's unsafe to go down and clean things up um but they eventually did not vote to spend the money to put the fence up so there are solutions because yes, I mean, if you're walking on the path in most other areas, you've got the road and you've got open, you can see what's going on around you. As you're going through the transit center, it's you and the brush and a bank. Yeah. And so you don't have that line of sight of what's going on right beside you. Um, and a not very active parking lot too. Cause I think the, I mean, there's parking all along some cutters way, which is very active, which I think helps you know, with like having eyes on the street kind of a thing, like the Jane Jacobs idea. But the parking lot over there isn't very active. I think it's next to the transit center, right? It's connected through the transit center. You have to like go through the transit yeah, center. It's, yeah, it's just for transit center residents. Okay. Oh, it, the one that behind Capitol Plaza? No, the one behind Capitol Plaza. Oh, you're talking about public. Yeah, okay. the one that I can picture that. Like right. You're talking about now. I just I often cut off of the bike path and into the Capitol Plaza parking lot. That's what everybody says. Yeah. But like, I Unless I'm pushing a stroller. It, or yeah. they go onto the train tracks. Because of that reason, because you think it's just scuzzy and you don't want to walk your family through it? Is that why? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I know. And I mean, we used to use the bike path as like, because if people aren't using it, then it's like a, it's a downward spiral, mm -hmm. you know? But... I don't know if I would use the it other, with the kids at this point. After the last meeting, I I did bike. Did you? On the bike path. At, at night. Eight o'clock at night. There's nobody there. It's totally dead. It's totally oh, fine. Interesting. Yeah. Was it well lit? No. No. It's okay. not lit at all. But I have it's quite like a bright light on the like the solution <laughs> of the, these situations is to like lighting. Have it well lit. Yeah. Yeah. There are a couple a couple of spots that have been identified in town that the lighting is not good, even off the bike path. Um what are the, what are the hours that they are the Good Sam guys host and versus not? That's only in the winter months from November first to about May. Oh, it's only in the winter. Yeah, it's only a winter shelter. It's an okay. emergency shelter. So, so where are folks going? I th they'll have to find places. In some cases, uh, some of them may have been um camping some of them may have been up at um you know in the motel program and they might come down during the day and okay. hang out and go okay. back up um it's just a winter that that thing's just i didn't realize that yeah. okay so 
that's where that's where the permanent shelter will come in and will help um if we can get a permanent shelter put in because then we've got more space to have year round um and you can start working with people um it's it's difficult to be in just a temporary shelter the good sam will will say that I know, it's curious whether people would say that the bike path feels safer in, during those months when Good Samaritan is operating oh. the shelter. Um, I mean, I don't. <laughs> I know I used to see a lot of folks up at Hubbard, you know, on the way to Hubbard Park, but I think, I mean, they'd camp out and loiter up in there, but I think a bunch of that state land and they started enforcing Right. You you would probably know better than I do, but I think they I, I think they kind of got chased out. And there are a number yeah, there are a number of homeless. We we don't want to to group everybody into one basket. Right. Uh, there are a lot of people who are homeless who are just in unfortunate situations, and they like everybody else just want to say stay stay safe and find a spot. And in a lot of ways, a lot of times. If somebody's out behind the Capitol or in different places and they're not bothering people, they're generally kind of left alone. Yeah. Right. Because you need to have a place. You're not bothering anyone. You're not making a mess. Yeah. You're you're not being a problem. Um, so usually those folks by by the fact that they're still there, it's probably mm -hmm. a fact that they're not bothering people. Right. Um, right. but as soon as people start bothering folks on the paths, then usually they get cleaned out pretty quick. Well, that, I mean, this is my other. But this is public concern, property. Down there that that if, this, if this behavior was happening on the corner of Main Street and State Street, like the, the town would not abide it for a second, that 12 year olds are getting sexually harassed by men. The fact that it's happening like out of sight to most people or to most, I wouldn't even say most people, most motorists. Um is why it's allowed to continue. If this was happening on the state house steps, it would never fly. But the fact that it's happening on a non-motorized path that mostly like children are using to get to high school. Mm -hmm. And like, I think it comes down to like who we value as society, you know, like what do we value? Um, and this is a area of the city that has been allowed to become unsafe for kids and people are looking the other way which is like, it's just so disturbing to me. Um, especially considering the millions I was invested, <laughs> you know, to like create this beautiful piece of infrastructure that would safely get children to the high school. And it's been, and that was, that was part of the reasoning for building it is like to get kids to high school. And it is currently functioning as like the opposite of getting kids safely to high school. They're being exposed to behaviors and aggression that they otherwise wouldn't get if they were on a city street. Um, so I think the fact that people are, and I don't, again, we don't, I don't know that they're homeless. I don't know who these people are. Um, it doesn't sound like all of them were. There. Some of them, the bike rider didn't sound like he was the one who went down and turned around and came back. I mean, there are a couple of instances that weren't, um, but it's this aggression that is allowed to continue and is going unchecked because people aren't going to the police about it because it doesn't rise to this, they don't feel it rises to the level of a crime or it's happening to children who don't want to tell. So the other children that I mentioned, they also don't tell their parents that they that they've had these experiences on the bike path. So the, the girl who said that she and her friends get, you know, questioned about how old they are. They're 14 they don't tell their parents what's happening. Um, so it is, <laughs> it's just like, it is shocking to me that this is happening and everyone's kind of like knows about it. And it's been allowed to continue for at this point years in these children's lives, you know? Um, so I don't think the solution is that we need more law enforcement or if they have a home and they want to be aggressive to kids. I think it is just like, how do we get people to stop being aggressive on the bike path? Um, having a shelter isn't 
Right. There's something else going on if someone's being aggressive with a child, you know. Right. Yeah, and so, I'm not a psychiatrist or a no. psychologist, so <laughs> it's outside of my like, planning hat. So if they had a shelter to go to at night, I don't. It's not. A, it's well, and there could be other people there. The there could be predators there, right? They may not yeah. be homeless. They could just be like, "This is the great place to go meet people." And we can hang out and yell at all. Well, I mean, it sounds terrible, want. right? But we can pull up a little yeah, matrix and we can find all the sex offenders around us. I mean, right. this is could do it. what I mean. It's the loitering and the hanging out is not the issue. And they, they, could, they think like they're the blending in with the homeless people. Nobody will ever even know who I am because I'm here with these other people. Right. You but know. the loitering facilitates the the ability to loiter there facilitates the. the I think like the unchecked behavior facilitates. Exactly. The aggression, like that they know they can get a, whoever is doing this know that they can get away with it. You, did did you send something around that I didn't see, Mike? It sounded like you had some design ideas or something. I sent, I think, just to you and Art, oh, to give you an idea oh, of like okay. where I thought. Are you like thinking like bench design or like like the the like, like removing removing some like brush lighting? Uh, yeah, I can I can send those link that round I, I definitely think there's something to do the idea that if you maintain a space right yeah you know, that keep that that prevents some sort of downward spiral if you can like convince people to use the path again i've lived in other places i don't know that it was a crime reason for it or a feeling of crime but that there was like a day my kids are grown so I don't know, but there was a day like it was like walk your kids to school day, right? And so like something like I mean I don't know that's kind of a grassroots type thing, but it seems like if you had a day like that where everybody was out on yeah. force, right, that that would send so, a signal. This is an important real estate for us. Something that was done that would be done in San Francisco whenever they wanted to protest, um, like bike advocates would do this when they wanted to protest like an unsafe street. Somebody had like died there, or had there been a severe accident. They would line, they would physically line the street in yellow shirts to protect the cyclists from cars. And so my husband, who's on the complete streets committee, we have talked about having safe routes to school and just having people out in yellow shirts, like lining the path to school so they mm -hmm. can speak at the school safely. Mm -hmm. um, and to bring awareness that like this currently is not safe for them. That's a good idea. Yeah. I like that. Right. Yellow t-shirts. Well, yeah. And, and having... Yeah, monitor basically mo path monitors out there. Um, but it's supposed the idea is that it's supposed to show government that they're currently not making something safe. So like, it's to bring awareness. Like we're all wearing yellow shirts to bring right. aware, like to bring safety, but then also to bring awareness. So like, this is not not good, not a good part of yeah. town. Yeah, yeah. Um. So I think there are like a bunch of things that you can do. I think the question is like, what does the planning, because it's like multifaceted, it's like law enforcement, it's social services, it's like the Department of Public Works, like there are all these different people that have a hand in this. Um, and then it's also just like straight up urban planning to me, like what the space looks like, what the built environment looks like. Is there a rusted rail car just sitting in the middle of town? So who owns the rail car? I know. <laughs> so I'm sure there's a story there because it's Montpelier. <laughs> so all of Stonecutter's Way is a was a rail yard. That's what it was. Um, four or five lanes wide all the way down. Um, two sets of railroads actually came in, one that went out to Chelsea and one that went out to Wells River or something, but now only the one that goes to Barrie and it stops. Mm -hmm. So... Um, the rail car still sits on the old rail property. And so it really falls outside of our stuff, but Guy's Farm and Yard uses it for their storage of materials. Uh -huh. They actually store it's yeah, used. Yeah, it's, it's used. used. Yep. I I kind of consider it a piece of public art. <laughs> <laughs> I, I thought it was too. Somebody else has considered it public art too. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wonder if they're, but this is again like, should should we pull back our uh, the public? I mean, I know we haven't gotten to the storyboard part of it, and we have plenty of time to comment. But the public safety should we be talking about 
you know, the public safety and some of these, there's, you know, we've got all kinds of, this is one space where we've got kids, but we've got all kinds of trail systems and all kinds of things that should we be addressing that somehow on our public safety plan? It was basically written by the police department, right? And, oh, and a right. consultant. So should, should we insert something in there talking about that? It's going to be in the next chapters on in October. In October, so yeah. That yeah. goes something to the to, next chapter. Something to look at. And transportation is the one we're wrapping up right now. So, mm -hmm. Right. But I think, yeah, I mean, I think that at some point this is this is a topic that goes beyond the planning commission. We can be a part of a bigger picture, I think. But I think this is ultimately going to be something that should be elevated more to the city council and city manager because it's going to take multiple departments. And anytime you're at that level. That's the place to coordinate it. Yeah, because it's going to be hard. The planning commission trying to plan for a piece of infrastructure that's owned by public works that's kind of part of the park system mm -hmm. yeah. that is also part of the recreation department you're you're we're already in four four departments right there but we can be an instigator right we can we can we can send a proposal to city council that says that you know we think this is a priority issue that should be looked at by the city council yeah it's beyond the certainly scope something of the planning that goes on department. and says right. through through our conversations i mean we're working on the city plan that says you know through our conversations this is an issue that we have heard in our experience and, and it needs to be elevated and needs to be addressed. And we think there are multiple solutions that need to be looked at, not just enforcement, but that's obviously, obviously enforcement will be one piece if there's, there are problem people there, they're not going to stop. And I'm sure the police would say they don't want us going out and trying yeah, to yeah. stop it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Unless you're wearing a yellow t-shirt. Yes, right, yellow t-shirt. It's been sanctioned. Marie, did you go to the last city council meeting? No. I, I feel like they, there was, I thought homelessness was a topic at the last mm. home, the last city council. Yes, it, it came up at that one. It's come up before. Most of it's been targeted on Country Club Road because we had, we had some folks that had been living out there. They hadn't been a problem, so everybody left them to, to stay out there. But then suddenly it got overwhelmed with a lot of other people coming in who were more problem. For people that were using recreation out there, that they were having they were similar camping, issues? Camping, homeless people camping in, in the back okay. areas in the woods and stuff. And so it wasn't an issue for most of the summer because there were only one or two. Mm -hmm. um, but then when a whole bunch of people came in, 10, 12 different groups came in, then there started to be a, uh, you know, a lot more drugs and fights and yeah, yeah, yeah. and there were a lot of arrests. So then the council cleaned it up. Okay. Said that was it. Okay. So a lot of the homelessness discussions that, that those were kind of centered on, on that, that area. And they were clearly, they were clearly sleeping there. That was, I think that is the that's the other issue is that we we don't know who is just hanging out in downtown Montpelier. Yeah, are these folks just hanging out, or are they right. actually homeless, or or who are the problem ones? You know, it may be a mix yeah. of homeless and not homeless, and we just don't know who the problem ones are. What about um, have we looked at? Uh, and like, if we know there are some hot spots, have we have we looked at putting cameras up or anything like that, just so that there we could It'd identify a question people for the police department? They'd have to. Uh, There's some deterrent effect to just knowing that somebody can see exactly who you are if somebody makes a complaint. Because because right. you're right, the 14 year old girl. I mean, any 14 anybody is going to put their head down and just get the heck out of there, oh, right? Yeah. They're not I mean, going to look to see who like, they are, but they could say at this time I was walking through and they can go look and they'll see exactly who it was. Yeah. yeah. I don't stop to have a conversation when they, I am engaged by them. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it's a, just a, Let's just a keep polite moving. good afternoon and we keep moving. Yeah. Uh, but yes, I was thinking that cameras and, and just a sign that says, you know, area under video surveillance probably could have some effect as well. All right. Those, those like see something, say something signs like that have phone numbers that you can call if something happens. We just to get the sense of that 
that it's that someone's looking at this, you know, um, because it is such a like a an unused part of town, you know. I think Montpelier Live was thinking like if we could have like food trucks on the, in that transit center parking lot, like something to draw people to. If the there was area. more activity, it would clean it. Yeah, and I think that I think that is like a hundred percent true. If yeah. there was activity there, yeah, this would go away. I love the idea of food trucks. <laughs> yeah, I love the idea of food yeah. trucks right there. Um, the the Confluence Park idea is um, currently dead, um, I believe. Yeah. Right. Yep. And I spoke to the the woman who was trying to spearhead that, and she thinks it's like very clearly related to the situation on the bike path that people are like, why would we spend more money there if we already spent all of this money? And we've, had and we've seen how it's problems. gone. Yeah. You know, like mm. why do we why would we put more money into this? Which is kind of the I think a larger fear is that the city gets skittish about spending these money like this on huge infrastructure projects if the projects fail, you know, I mean, the, the path is currently not used. It's failing. <laughs> like, people are using the parking lots. They're using the train tracks. Not many people go on that part of the, the path. Yeah. I did walk on it this past week, even um, just walking by and walking the dog, pushing the stroller. And it was there were quite a few people out and they, I was, you know, offered to engage in conversation that I declined. Yeah. But also I feel like that sense of unease is also an issue, you know, like the, the feeling of not feeling secure in a space is, it, is itself an issue because you're not going to want to go back there. Mm -hmm. Getting threatened is like a whole other level. You know? Yeah, for sure. That I, I, it's always something that, you know, I think about, but I've never had right. a, had to think about something that negative. But I'm, I'm saying like, even, but even that like feeling of apprehension itself, mm -hmm. you don't want people to have when they're using public parks, you know, like that's not a good, mm -hmm. that's not good design. If people are like, have to like brace themselves, <laughs> <It's> like <laughs> use a public park, you know? Yeah. So, I mean, I would be interested if we had more commission members here to see what they would. I think we should bring it up again. I would support some kind of letter from this commission to the city council asking them to do some things. Certainly, I think we could add some language to the public safety part of it. I mean, it's such an important resource. I, I didn't know. I mean, I'm one of the members of the community that wouldn't have yeah. known that this was an issue if you hadn't. You know, brought it up. Although I, I have seen that little area, and it does look a little, you know, it's a little sketchy and dirty, right? Like right. you know that, but um, you know, you want people to use these resources. You want people to feel like this is a place to visit or to live. You know, like, and that's part of it. So we have these great resources. Yeah, and Montpelier Live is in that too. Yeah, that know? people get dropped off at the transit center from whatever you know method of transport they're using, and then their instinct is to use the bike path to get to downtown and like that's their first mm -hmm. their first view of montpelier is that you know yeah. which is right mm -hmm. <laughs> sean <laughs> well thanks I for think, bringing yeah, it up I, I, thanks i i think there's some low-hanging fruit uh um just cleaning the place up is cleaning up and like cutting, it's the old cutting, it's the old, and cutting things it's down. the old broken windows theory right like yeah. it's yeah. Very if you got broken windows you have crime if you got overgrown stuff that people can hide under the hedges they're like nobody cares about this nobody's right. looking at it yeah yeah i yeah. think it exactly is what it is we had stopped to i had to stop i was pushing the stroller and we had to stop and watch them put in the new car chargers because they had a mini excavator over there behind uh -huh. behind the hardware store and then just even standing there looking at all the stuff growing into the bike path. And and now that they've got their, the, the railroad is working on the, oh, on the right. track and that is now chain link fenced and you're constrained yeah. and there's chain link fence on one side and there's all the vegetation growing in from the other. It's, 
I do take my photography classes there because it's like a beautiful version of like urban gothic, you know? <laughs> I'm not sure that that's such an endorsement. I know, but I'm like, guys, do you see the railroad, like the weeds? It's all coming together right here. <laughs> I, Frankenstein's just come right out of the I mean, bushes. Their photos are stunning oh. in that sense, but I don't know if that's. What I think <laughs> you could eliminate the weeds and still get some good urban market. I know, like in it, the shrubbery it, too. Like I feel like there's like a lot of like hiding spots, yeah. or like farther on the bike path where I run, there's nowhere to like there's no shade, there's nowhere to go, and no so one. Do you do you head like towards, towards Agway? Yeah, yeah. And no, I mean, no one hangs out there. No, right? Because it's hot <laughs> there's no shade <laughs> it's overgrown but it's there's no there's nothing there's nowhere to go there's nowhere to hang out you know yeah. it is purely a path and it's i think widely used i see people there all the time i'm sure the city's i mean there used to be it seems like when we moved here there was a change to some loitering policy mm. i don't know exactly what that was mike do you remember there was something and then we kind of freed it up and then there was a lot of panhandling that was going on i don't know if we pushed back on that but I mean, we like people to be able to visit and sit on a, on a you know, sit on a, a bench and, you know, drink a cup of coffee or whatever they're going to do. But do, do you right. remember that background at all, Mike, about the loitering ordinance or anything? Um, I don't. That's not one that I was able to. When did you come on board? 2014. I mean, it may have happened, and I, think I it was just right around that. I think it was right around that time, maybe a little bit after. I mean, I'm not proposing that, but it's just like, right. What, what do you do? You know, it's so interesting. You go to all these, you go to different communities, right? And you see they have the same kind of infrastructure, and it's beautiful, and you don't have the problems, and you just wonder, like, okay, what are I, I, what's what are their policies? Like, how do they manage to? Because clearly there's people that are affluent that somebody would love to shake down and get some money out of, but they don't have the same problems. And why is that? I don't, mm -hmm. I don't know. Oh, that's yeah, Aaron. Aaron. He has joined us. We have a call for him. Here I was running through my security protocols. Well, hi, everybody. Hey. Hi, I'm sorry for being late. I'm, I'm actually in Montana and I forgot that it was two hours Holy cow. As, opposed, as opposed to one so <laughs> oh my god here i am yeah so <laughs> i don't know if we need to go and jump into all the other stuff now that we have a quorum, <laughs> that we have a quorum but we can is there anything that you need to get done mike since we have aaron here or is, can it all wait what do you think no i mean if people want to take minutes <laughs> take a look at um, what I sent out on the energy notes this afternoon, that would be. I looked at it. I would just say I'm very unqualified. Maybe you guys have better background. But... I don't have a yeah, it was. Energy. Yeah, most of. So we got a lot of comments, um, and I went through and tried to. So we wrote energy was one of the earlier chapters or earlier ones that we did, maybe 2018, 2019. They did a big planning project in 2021. So a lot of the stuff, and then we didn't update the chapter. So it they rightly went through and said that you got you're missing all the stuff. So I went through, read the new plan, and tried to go back to the same format. Um they had sent some comments along, which would have been about uh, uh, added a couple more goals. I know we have a goal of trying to minimized the number of goals. So the first three goals that are of the six talk about the municipal and the next three talk about the community because we have a 2030 goal of being net, excuse me, being net zero and a 2050 goal to be net zero for the community. So 2030 is to be government, um, city hall, all these buildings would be net zero. And then the other ones are about how do we make the community net zero by 2050? Um, so that's why we've got six, but they would have had a lot more if we kind of followed theirs. So that's why I squished them down. But the idea was really just to start looking at if if it looks okay, and for folks who've kind of been through this before, if it looks like we're heading in the right direction, I can go and start 
pulling all these together. And then I, I laid out strategies based on those goals. Um, I will say that I read it all and I didn't have any problems with any of it, but I also felt like somebody else should be looking at this. That isn't, is that me? Yeah. I did send it to the chair and vice chair of, of me act to go and take a peek at and get their input as well. Um, and I'm going to go to the me act committee in October, but I kind of need to, to pull it together. So I figured if we had enough people and people had thoughts, you can send them to me. You don't have to go over it tonight, but if you've got thoughts, if you think, you know, um, some of these kind of look okay, it's, it's really rough. I mean, it's just putting things in a couple of, of boxes. So you've got one goals, one through six, and then strategies for goal one strategies for goal two. Um, and those are mostly based on those reports. So I, I think it all looks good. Do we feel good enough to tell Mike to keep working on it? Well, I have a question, Mike. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no. Um, so goal number two, it says reduce climate impacts of fossil fuel use in schools and municipalities. Um, is, it, is it just reduce fossil fuel use? What is, I don't understand why the climate impacts of is in there. Um, yeah, that's true. And I was trying to insert, and I'll, and I'll go and see if their wording was, if they were talking about the, the climate impacts, because it might just be reduced fossil fuel use in schools and municipal facilities through conversion to non-fossil fuels and other measures. Or like reduce climate impacts by reducing fossil fuel use in schools. Yep. And we might be able to just emphasize climate impacts in the storyboard portion because really when we get to the to the goals it may just be i think know, everybody knows why we're reducing yeah fossil fuels. why we're doing that that's from the storyboard and then the third goal is there and you just said 2030 is there like a date attached to that or is that just all vehicles used by schools is there a goal um all three one two and three are all supposed to be reaching net zero it's actually in the aspiration which i didn't write the okay. aspiration will remain the same the aspiration says we'll be 2030 net zero by 2030 that's the city the city yeah city government um and then montpelier as a whole will be net zero by 2050 so that's working with property owners to weatherize their houses and convert from oil heat to some other non-fossil fuel heat those types of things. How do we, you know, it's, it's a much, it's much easier to do it for the city government because we are yeah. in, you know, we're kind of in, um, we can tell ourselves what to do. It's more difficult to go and tell community members. Um, everybody may want to do it, but they may not be able to afford it. Right. right. So, yeah, that, so goal number six then, um, I, I, I guess it's fine. It's fine. But, uh, you know, obviously a lot of the stuff in here, you know, doing this, having the city do things is within our control and having individuals do them is very much outside of <laughs> right. our control as it should be. Uh, but it's, I think it's, I think it's fine that some of these things, you know, they're good goals to have, good aspirations to have. Uh, and I wonder, you know, at least in the near term, we're going to run into a like preferred contractor type situation where we realize that, oh man, we need to uh, actually kind of pause this requirement mm -hmm. uh, for yeah, the city. So, so some of the questions that will, some of the things that MEAC will bring up is like, well, we could have, different energy standards. If you're building something new, then you have to meet a higher energy standard and we could adopt that as an ordinance. Now that affects all new buildings and that doesn't affect the existing, but it helps to make sure new buildings get built to certain codes. And there may be- Well, you could do things with rent. There may be people that are re have rental properties have to conform by a certain date. I mean, there's some enforcement mechanisms that you could put into play. Yeah, if there was, if there was the, the political muscle to, to do it, there are different things. If, you, if the city wanted to raise funds to do a revolving loan fund where um, 
you know, maybe it costs $30,000 to weatherize a house. Well, we could loan you the $30,000, 0%, and then that goes as a mortgage on your property. And when you sell your property, you give us the money back and we can loan it to somebody else. Um, but of course, we need to raise all that money first. Mm -hmm. So where, where do we get that seed money to start that type of revolving loan fund? Um, you know, there, there's small things, you know, there, there are people that do window inserts and there are people that do different, different, smaller things. But I think if we're going to reach net zero, it's going to be more than just weatherizing storm windows. It's going to be, you know, how do we actually deep weatherize houses to, to get them maybe not necessarily to net zero, but at least better than they were. Um, you know, I, I like to use as an example, the house I had lived in before I moved was in East Hardwick. And when we bought it, it had used 900 gallons of fuel oil to heat. When I sold it, um, it wasn't using any fuel oil. Um, it would, you if you used the, the wood stove, it would use a quart of wood. Um, if you use the, the oil stove, it would use, if you use the, still use the furnace, it would use about 75 gallons a year. Wow. So you did a good job. Yeah. So you can weatherize houses really, really well to, to, you know, to really knock a lot of that out. And, um, you know, I've got a lot of work to do in my new house, <laughs> but yeah, but those are the types of investments that if everybody did it, you could dramatically decrease the amount of home heating fuel that is being used to heat the houses. Um, that doesn't get cars off the road, but it does get um, heating fuel. And that's probably the easiest one for the city to try to tackle is how do we work with people to get their houses to be more deep weatherized? Mm -hmm. uh, what are the programs that we could do to help that happen? There's a lot of incentives through Efficiency Vermont, but it's not enough to get everybody to do it. So what can we do to helps get us over the limit, over that line. Um, but th those are the things that that's what we rely on the, um, MEAC to try to come up with. How do we, how do we do that? And they've, they've focused on the 2030, rightfully so that's the deadline that's coming up the quickest and let's figure out how we can do city government. And then, um, that's why I think one of the big ones for them is to come up with a 2050 plan. There are a lot of ideas. Maybe we could do this. Maybe we could do that. At some point, MIAC has to hire a consultant and come up with a 2050 plan, just like they did for their 2030 plan, and really lay it out and says, these are the best ways to get um, efficiency work done. That's the first goal four is how do we make houses more efficient? Energy efficiency, weatherization, group, you know, uh, strategy five, how do we get people to have their houses off fossil fuel. So you're not cooking with gas, you're not uh, heating with oil, you're still gonna need heat. So maybe they're heat pumps, maybe that's wood chip or pellet stoves. Um, maybe you're on district heat in some cases if you're a commercial building in the downtown. And then six is how do we get people out of their cars or how do we get people to buy electric cars? It's going to be harder for us. Burlington actually offers incentives. They, they they have their own electric department and they match, I think, some of the state incentives. So if you want to buy an electric car, Burlington, mm -hmm. but that's their, that's how they do it. Aaron's Aaron. got a hand up. Hi, yeah, thanks. I just have two quick questions. Number one is, like, it sounded like, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it sounded like you've given this to MIAC for some feedback. And if that's the case, when do you expect that feedback? Because I think I might have some stuff to add, but um, not right now. Yeah, if you've so, got, if you got stuff to email at some point, I'm getting, I'm trying not to make this be 50 more iterations. Um, so I'm going to, I'm trying to work with the key people, Kate and the chair, uh, whose name escapes me right now. Um, and we're going to, get their comments, get some of your comments, just so that when I put it all together into a new draft, I will take that to them like October 17th to the whole of MEAC. And then you'll get some comments back. So probably in November, we'll be able to have a conversation of what the final draft looks like. Okay, perfect. Um, and then the second question is, in the strategy six for the development of the 2050 plan, it's add EV charge. Oh, I'm sorry, it's the zoning to allow for EV charges without permits. What's the permitting 
structure now. Like, so currently, actually, that's that was really just to go through and point out the fact that EV chargers don't need permits. So right now, we actually ex removed EV chargers as a as a permit item. As long as the EV charger is associated with a permitted parking space, then it doesn't need a permit. Okay. So this is just, this is the status quo. Yep, this is the status quo. Right. So yeah, right. sometimes we talk about strategy. Some of it is just to continue what we're doing. And sometimes we want to let people know what it is we're doing. Um, okay. Yeah, I just wasn't aware of any permitting requirements. That's why I asked. So thank you. Yep. What is a home labeling ordinance? I've got to get the exact name of it. There is a requirement that was passed. I'm not sure personally if I think it's actually working or worthwhile. Certainly when I bought my house, I didn't get any information on it. So they a few years back, there was a request in that if we required sellers of homes to give a energy efficiency report that it would encourage uh, and provide information to buyers as to the energy efficiency and buyers will then shop around for the best, most energy efficient home. And it will encourage sellers to make energy improvements to their home. <laughs> Assumes there's any houses them. to buy. <laughs> Truth is my, in my opinion is I, you know, I thought this was just, this was, you know, you know, one, whatever the expression is for one, one thing too cute or whatever. It was just, mm -hmm. yeah, it's just go after the issue and don't try being fluffy around the edges and go through and tell real estate agents, they have to go and post labels as to how efficient the house is. And there was a specific program that you had to go through. Like I said, I just bought a house. I never saw any report. I never asked for it. Um, yeah. I had a house that I could afford that was available and I put a bid on it. And if the house is, has energy improvements done to it, you will hear about it. <laughs> yeah. And this yeah. one had no energy yeah. efficiency to it at all. And I still paid asking price. So that's actually pretty lucky. I yeah. You only paid asking, asking price. Yeah. <laughs> no so, bidding war. No, I died. Well, at the top of my top of my thing, I told my agent, "I'm like, that's it. That's all we can afford." <laughs> and we were very happy to see that we won. So, wow. Um, but yeah, that's what the home labeling ordinance is. Um, there's there's enforcement pieces and other pieces that were kind of waived and tabled and put off to the side. And I don't know how much actual enforcement goes into it. So. But it is an actual thing that is on the book, so oh, we'll, it we'll exists. describe it. It does exist. Okay. Interesting. Fascinating. I do, I do think I sold some condos, and I do think I had to have some report, and they were brand new. I thought it was bizarre. No, that's because you crossed your teeth yes. and got your eyes, Gabe. I, well, I probably had somebody coming from the city that was going to inspect it or something, so I had this. I know I had a report. But yeah, I wouldn't it's be surprised possible. that some people don't. It's possible if there was some, uh, if, if you had a real estate agent who just knew the rule existed, they may do it. I might have had a real estate agent, agent that might have known something about the way the city operated. <laughs> it might have felt it's in their best interest might. to make sure that they followed the rules that had been passed. Might have happened. Um, so, and my real estate agent did not. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure my real estate agent knew about it and chose <laughs> not to do it anyways. So, but. Worried uh, that you would shop around? No. <laughs> <laughs> he used to work for me. So, you know, <laughs> I knew his opinion on the, the home labeling ordinance. So it didn't surprise me if he didn't follow it. But. Um, so, yeah, that's if people have thoughts or comments, let me know. Like I said, most of this was not to really get into a big debate about the details of it more just, you know, if 
I have to now turn you yeah. know this pretty piece of paper into that nice board that's out on the wall. Yeah. And so if we're going to put in that much effort, if anybody had thoughts at the start of, I like the way it was done before, but no, you should go ahead. I will go ahead and make make up a, a another draft, basically another first draft, and I'll run it by Miak and I'll run it back to you guys in November, and we'll hopefully so get it finalized. Then, do you want to um, put that back out then for public input, or you know wait? That for will the... be up to you guys. Okay. Let's see how that so goes. Do you? Well, when you guys see it, when you guys see it, I don't think you have to make the decision now. Um, I, but, I imagine we spent a bunch of money having a consultant work on some things, right? The, but this is uh, there's this is also going to carry over to the storyboard then as well. Yeah, there'll yeah. there'll be storyboard changes there. So we should we should put it back out there. Uh, there is eventually going to be a full public hearing. So y yes, we will eventually obviously have to go back out. The mm -hmm. question is, do we go back out for one more round before? And that may be something that when we get to the end, as I said, we're going to go through 12 chapters. And that was our goal is get through all 12 chapters. We'll see where we're at. Right. And what's our timeline, Mike? When do we think we're going to get through all of them? Uh, it was supposed to be this fall, but we've kind of gotten ourselves a little. We're going we didn't to meet in August and we're going to make it. <laughs> gonna, new guy. We got we got all of October, We're doing really November. Well, for the first six, the only one that really seems is, is really the energy one. That's the only one that seems to be needing well, that got more work. But we knew rewrite. this when we did this. We're gonna do twelve, mm -hmm. and after we do twelve. You know, everyone's like, "Well, it's not ready. It's not ready. It's not ready." So, well, we're gonna do twelve. We're gonna end up with like two or three that people want to talk more about. Mm -hmm. And for the most part, I think we've done our first six and we've had housing that needs a little more conversation, but I actually think it's pretty good. I think it's pretty close and energy that needed a lot more work. Now we're starting our next three in the next meeting and then we'll figure that out, which we actually have to talk a little bit about the next meeting right. because that lands on Columbus Day or oh, Indigenous okay. Persons Day. And... I don't know if we want to push that to Tuesday or if we want to just meet on that Monday. I don't know what everyone's schedule looks like. Is it a city holiday? Well, it is a, it is a city holiday. So you won't be working. Or... Well, I could, <laughs> unfortunately I have another meeting on Tuesday night. So it kind of okay. pushes me in a pinch, but if everybody said they were out, then that's great. I'll, I'll bump my other meeting on Tuesday. Um, I could probably make it. Uh, but if everyone was like, nah, we're not doing anything anyways. But I, it is. I, I have Tuesday conflicts, so I could. You have a Tuesday conflict? Too? I, I could make it on Monday. Okay. I think I, I could make it on Monday. I don't know. I usually can make it, but I also know I like, if my wife had the day off, then we might like to do something, but mm -hmm. we'll figure it out. But it's also going to be a public input session. It's also a public yeah, input so session. Yeah, so we can't, session. probably can't oh, do yeah, it I as would, a public input session. Though. Three days I know. We pushed so, it to Wednesday. That's just a public input. Uh, let me take <laughs> let me take a look. What, how were people on Thursdays? I I have a standing. Have I, standing I, always, I always have a conflict on Thursdays. Okay, mm -hmm. so Sorry. Wednesdays would be probably. But, this, but you can have a quorum without me. So, I think it's more the public. If they're not here on. Yeah, I'll have to see if it's a council night. I don't know okay. when council is. They kind of bump around a little bit so if it's a council night then wednesday probably won't work okay that's why i was asking about thursday as a fallback just in case yeah i, think yeah. I, could do I, I do. do a wednesday and i can't do a thursday but i think you've done thursdays before and had enough members show up yeah yeah i coach i coach tuesday thursdays tuesday thursdays okay so that's two people out on thursdays and we're already two people down so that kind of have there been any applications to be on the mission? I have to see. So okay. I've tell, Brian, I've tell people. Brian isn't coming yeah. back. So right. I know. Right, yeah. So uh he, his term is going to be up as well. So we will now have two seats to fill. Um 
but Gabe is coming back and Maria is coming back. So we've got two of the four. I submitted my application. Oh, that's right. And and Sean, because technically I'm wrapping up. A, you came in mid year. Yeah, I'm wrapping up. Uh, okay. Yep. And technically Carlton's seat is a one year seat. So we have a one year seat and a two year seat. Oh. That's okay. open. What did I apply for? Am I going into a two-year or a one-year? This will be going into a two-year seat. Okay. Because yep. you're filling your existing. Okay. Okay, so this is. So they'll, day... you'll just coordinate offline with Ariane and. Yeah, Maria we'll coordinate and let date. everybody know what the date is. Okay. But doesn't sound like Monday, doesn't sound like Tuesday, doesn't sound like Thursday. We'll see if Wednesday works. And this is the 9th and 10th that we're discussing, October 9th and 10th. Or now, fourteen later. Is it farther? Next Monday is oh, Monday seven. It's on every 14th. other Monday. Yeah, it we are the second Monday. <laughs> it's the second and second and fourth. So we are the fourteenth and twenty eighth. Sixteenth and seventeenth is what we're discussing. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we'll see if the sixteenth is a council meeting or not. I don't think it is. So 16th might work. Because they are also second and fourth. Mm -hmm. So usually they are the same week that we are, except that the first is on Tuesday. So they're meeting the 9th and 23rd. Okay. So unless they've moved it on me, but we'll find out. And I will let you guys know. And that's that's it for my and, and we my probably time. don't need to adjourn because we never really opened, right? Right. <laughs> Well, I have a question for you guys about the bike path, though. Should I, I mean, you mentioned like opening up to like front porch forum, which I was scared to do because I was like worried about like the the avalanche of there would have been a lot, that might come in. I, I think it sounds like you have enough okay. information anecdotally for us to, first of all, make an additional input into the public safety plan. And then second of all, to write something I, I would endorse, like if you drafted something, I would endorse it okay. and send it, you know, through Mike to the city council asking them to, you know, have a hearing on it or something. And I'll bring it up with the leadership team and the leadership team at the city are all the department heads. So we, mm -hmm. we meet at least once a week, sometimes twice a week to talk about issues. And it may just be something that we find out from them what they think is a good approach. I mean, we've got everybody from the community justice center who's on the leadership team to the rec director, to the parks director, to the police, to the fire. So but they, I, they may have some ideas of what, you know, maybe they, maybe they want to sponsor a meeting or host a meeting that is a more of a public conversation about it. That's what I was, was going to say. I think everyone knows it's an issue. Like, I think everybody in Montpelier knows that this is a part of town that is unsafe. But I think it's when you hear, like, the individual stories that you get a sense of, like, how dangerous it potentially is. Um, and so even just... And there's not a solution so, on the horizon. Right, like, how if I'm like, city council, you're like, wait, what? People are congregating on the bike path? I th but I think it's, like, once they hear those, like, actual stories of what people are having to put up with that it can change minds. Um, so maybe it's a public meeting like, the, like you're saying, or, or in the we, we letter. We can put it write, as a, on an you know. agenda for next steps okay. and I'll, I'll talk, see what the leadership team wants to, how they want it and you know, what they suggest doing. It's because they, this is going to be bigger than, just the planning department or whoever. So, and it may be an issue that just the manager's office has to go and take on to go through and say, this is a bigger topic. And they just had a big um, issue. They were addressing it with, with the legislature and with the, the administration about what to do with the homeless. Uh, they need shelter. Where, where do we shelter them? Where do they go to get shelter? If they're not allowed on state land, not allowed on city land, you know, They've got to be somewhere. Right. Um, so what's the solution? 
and we're going to have to have this type of conversation as well. What do we do in this situation when things are unsafe? Yeah. I mean, one of the mothers said to me, she's like, do I have to wait for more? Does the kid have to be raped before the city will do something it's about terrible. it? terrible. You know, and it's kind of like, and the, the fact that kids are scared to tell adults what's happening, I think is You can see so how disturbing. terrible could happen, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so I just want to make sure that our concerns are also wrapped in this kind of like, it's the concern isn't just like this generic, like, eh, it's kind of sketchy. Like the concern is that we've talked to people and it's a really dangerous situation. Um, I mean, I'm I mean, probably going to probably even, everyone. you could probably even format what you have as a spreadsheet as yeah, an attachment. And like, we could, we could all sign the cover letter. Like I would support that. You, You've done interviews, right? Like you've talked to people. Here's anecdotal data. Somebody else can go out. The police department can go out and do their own if they want to do it. But it sounds like if you were able to do this without right. a lot of like detective work, right? You just talk to some people. Just That's asking, like, like, yeah. I mean, like at soccer games, like, oh, hey, you take the bike path. <laughs> like, <laughs> right. I, mean, I literally have like asked everybody I know. Yeah. I would, I would totally support doing something formal. Okay. I mean, should yeah. we push it off to the next meeting to like, like formally? Well, I think do this? You, somebody probably needs to draft something, right? Right. Yeah. If you have something to so present, something drafted the by the next meeting. Meeting, we can. Okay. Yeah, we just send it to us beforehand. We'll all. Yeah, we can put it as the next next and... steps item on the agenda. Okay. Thank you guys for listening to it. Yeah. And it's like, it's like terrible. sticking your head out. It's, well, it's, it is. Yeah. It's but, it's also something that I, I don't know, but just that I, yeah, just, right. It's, a, it's my privilege that I get to brush it off a little bit, mm -hmm. uh, even though it's not fun, but I, I don't, well. I just can, can brush it off, but obviously it is scary. we need to not brush it off. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. Thank you yeah. guys. Thanks, Mike. All right. So I guess we'll see you in whenever we see it. Yeah. Whenever we'll let everybody know when the next meeting is. All right. Thanks, Aaron. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a good trip, Aaron. Thanks everybody.